what we're going to hear about next from Luke Chang is uh, one of the topics will be his work trying to look at naturalistic conversations of, of humans. So Luke is an assistant professor of psychological and brain sciences at Dartmouth and directs the computational social affect of neuroscience lab. He completed a BA in psychology at Reed College and he has a master's in psychology from the New School for Social Research, as well as a PhD in clinical psych and cognitive neuroscience of Arizona uh, with Alan Santi. Luke completed his pre-doc clinical internship in behavioral medicine at UCLA and a postdoc uh, at UC Boulder under the mentorship of Tor Weiger. His research program is focused on understanding the neurobiology and computational mechanisms underlying social interactions. And he's actively involved in emerging fields of social, affective, and decision neurosciences and uses advanced models to understand how we learn and how we make decisions in social contexts, as well as how pain and emotions can be regulated through social interactions. With that, uh, Nick, I mean, uh, Luke, please take it away. Great. Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is such a, a fun meeting of merging of like tech and psychiatry, and um, and this panel I think is um, really brought um, gets me excited about uh, being involved in this type of work. Um, so I'm going to tell you um, a, a sampling of of work we've been doing trying to study emotional experiences and social interactions in our lab. Um, it's one of the things we think is really important is of course, like statistical power and making sure you have enough subjects in your samples and um, is important in time points, but also um, sampling the space of, of the type of construct you're studying. So if it's emotion or social interactions, we think is really important. And naturalistic paradigms sort of afford um, much more variation and, and we think is really important moving forward. But unfortunately, they also, um, it presents a lot of technical challenges. So I'll kind of talk about some of those along the way and how we're trying to solve them. Um, so this doesn't normally seem naturalistic until you're stuck in your house for nine months during a pandemic where most of the time you spend through a screen on Zoom or um, watching TV, uh, but screens nonetheless. Um, so in this work, what we've been trying to do is come up with ways we can elicit feelings and Hollywood's done a, a wonderful job of um, creating um, excellent content. Um, and so we basically just show um, these shows in, um, in the lab and outside the lab um, and then also in the scanner. Um, and one thing that's really important is that these shows have been selected to um, uh, really uh, like create um, uh, powerful emotional experiences. So this particular one I'll use mostly throughout the, the talk today is, is um, the first episode from Friday Night Lights. Um, <clears throat> and one important thing is that once you start um, eliciting experiences, there's a lot of individual variation. Um, so uh, some people might find uh, things like really exciting and you get this like it, like a lot of exuberance and then other people might seem a little flatter um, but it's really because they're just experiencing and finding different things amusing so when that same quarterback was throwing the winning touchdown this particular individual um, finds amusing when he makes a mistake and hits his teammate in the head um, so there's lots of individual variations in these and I think that's really important when you're trying to study um, things like emotions and social interactions, and also if we want to um, use these for translation applications, it's important to preserve the, the ideographic nature of these experiences. So we've scanned people um, while they watch the show, and um, what one of the challenges is like, how do you actually analyze the data because we don't have like a traditional task structure. Um, so one approach um, that's pioneered by um, Uri Hassan uh, is to look at the similarity or the shared responses or the reliability of um, uh, brain signals across subjects. So what I'm showing here is um, a few subjects while they watch this, this show, and this is average activation from early visual cortex, and each line is a different subject. And the level of, of coupling or synchronization in time across subjects um, gives us um, a, a metric of, of reliability. Um, and so we can do a subject-by-subject subject, um, correlation of these signal time series signals, and then take the mean of that of that correlation matrix to give us a metric to summarize the inner subject synchrony or coupling. So when we do this across the brain while they, while um, participants watch the show, we see um, very strong um, degrees of synchronization in primary sensory cortices, so like primary auditory and um, visual cortex, but we see um, considerably less synchronization as we get to the front of the brain, which is presumably much more involved in, um, in making meaning of what you're watching and, and the experiences and bringing in your past um, uh, experiences and homeostatic states and, and integrating that with this information. And so because that's so unique to each individual, that might explain why we're seeing um, decreased coupling. Of course, for those of you who know um, much about fMRI, another possibility is that there's just a lot more distortion and signal dropout, and especially in the ventral parts of the frontal cortex due to susceptibility artifact. 
Um, so to try to rule that out, we've also um, uh, recorded um, using stereotactic electro electrodes from patients with intractable ep epilepsy while they're being monitored um, um, inpatient. And they watch the same show. And we also ca um, calculate the degree of intersubject synchrony. We only have 12 patients here um, while they watch the same episode. And we see the same thing. So we see much higher levels of um, synchronization, synchronization of um, power across different frequency bands in primary sensory, like auditory, and considerably less in regions of the VMPFC. So it doesn't seem to be an fMRI specific thing. It's, it's probably more like these regions um, do things that are more similar across people, like sensory, which makes sense, um, or they're much more idiosyncratic across people, like the um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So if we're not going to able to study these regions by averaging over subjects, like how should we proceed? So one thing we've tried to do is to look at single subjects. And so what I'm showing here is if we extract um, activation patterns from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and think of um, a point in time as a, a point in a multidimensional space where each axis reflects um, the bold the activation in a single voxel, we can see how similarity in that of the position in that space changes over time in a single subject. So I'm showing here, again, as another correlation matrix, but this reflects for a single subject while they're watching the show over 45 minutes, um, how patterns in their prefrontal cortex are similar over time. And one thing that's, I think, um, pretty visually salient is that you see this uh, block diagonal structure such that um, uh, this particular participant um, appears to persist in a specific state um, for long periods of time, up to about three or four minutes. Um, and then they transition to a different state where these patterns are not correlated with each other. And there appears to be some recursion where they, um, the participant revisits similar states. So this is just one subject. And if we start looking at other ones, um, we can see that they all um, exhibit this block diagonal structure, but the specific time points of which they're um, persisting in states is, is actually quite different across them. And there, if you squint, you, you might be able to see um, specific scenes where a few of the subjects are persisting. Um, so this happens to be this game-winning touchdown scene. Um, but if we actually try to quantify this over larger um, samples, um, there doesn't seem to be much um, structure across or similarity across um, subjects. So to try to quantify these state changes and, and, and figure out what's going on, um, we basically fit a model where we're trying to identify these hidden state changes um, that are going on and as they're being reflected in patterns of, of, of brain activity in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And we do this per subject and we fit a, a hidden Markov model where we're trying to learn what the patterns of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex are with each state and also how they're tra transitioning um, to the next time point. And when we run the model back through the, the same subject's data, we can get predictions about what um, state the, the, the subject is most likely in a given point in time. And if we plot that back on, on that first subject's um, uh, spatial recurrence matrix, we can see that it does a nice job capturing what we see by eye over where these state transitions are. And so we fit this for separately for every subject. And what's interesting is if we look at the spatial patterns across subjects, there actually, at least for a couple of states, seems to be a high degree of, of similarity. So what this means is that each subject is probably having at least um, two states that are common across people based on their pattern of, of, of activation, um, but probably that they're not being expressed at the same points in time, which is why we didn't see anything from the synchronization um, analyses. Um, so to try to um, quantify a little bit more in time what's going on, we can align um, the states across subjects and then try to see at any given point, time point, um, how many subjects are, are occupying the same um, hidden state or what percentage of the subjects um, are in concordance with um, each other. And so what I'm plotting here is the state concordance from two different um, samples we've recorded from the VMPSC, and, um, and that's over time while they watch the movie. And there's a, there's a couple time points highlighted where, um, so when the star quarterback gets paralyzed and everyone's um, worried and concerned or maybe a little anxious, there's one state that persists there and, and you can see in dark blue. And then later when the, the backup quarterback comes to throw a game-winning touchdown, um, there's a, they transition to another state and at least six, you know, about 60, 70% of the um, participants um, occupy the same state at that moment in time. So what's interesting about this, this is sort of like a reverse inference about what's going on in this region based on what's going on in the movie. Um, but that's, it's, it's a little, it's a little um, subjective. So we can try to quantify this a little bit more um, by time locking these responses in the brains of subjects in the scanner with time um, um, responses and other measures from other participants seeing the same show. So we've done this a couple different ways. So in one study, we recorded people's facial expressions and used um, computer vision techniques similar to what Rana um, Al-Kalubi uh, mentioned, where we tried to map um, uh, pixels into face, um, groups of facial muscles so that we can describe um, the type of effective state that they might be experiencing. 
And we've also had different participants online uh, watch these movies and then we sparsely sample how they're feeling um, across 16 different dimensions. And then we use um, um, some techniques from uh, called collaborative filtering to infer what their time series are that's in, in we'll still maintain some individual variation. So what that allows us to do is to have a time series across different samples um, that are facial expressions and also um, feelings. And we can estimate um, a cross experiment um, latent factor model where we can um, see what's common across all these experiments in time. So what, what of the facial expressions and what of the, the emotional feelings seems to correspond to these um, state concordances in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And you can see um, in this bottom one where we're plotting the latent components that are common across the, the different experiments, that it seems it, it, there's some degree of similarity with these VMPFC states, particularly the dark, um, the red and the dark blue. And what's really neat about this technique is we can look at the experiment specific projections into this common space and plot them to visualize what type of facial expressions were people using that's, course, that's, that's time locked to the VMPFC um, um, state concordances and also the, the feelings. And if, if you kind of focus on the facial expressions for the moment, um, state one, you see um, a corrugator responses. So it's basically people smiling more. And in state two, you see um, it's more of a dimpler. So people are starting to frown and their, their eyebrows um, uh, raise um, a little bit. And um, in, the, in the other study where people are rating their subjective ex um, experiences, uh, these states are also um, associated with positive things like hope, pride, joy, um, and, and also more negative things for the other state like sadness, um, fear, um, also hope and interest, there's some overlap. So what this is really neat is that there's some hidden state of how people are feeling and we're able to see manifestations of it across these different measurement modalities and by simply making an assumption that something's coupled in time, but yet allowing everybody to have a, a slightly different experience. Um, so we've kind of tried to build on top of this by uh, bringing people into the lab um, and watching the same show, except rather than watching one episode, we have them watch four episodes. And, and some of the participants watch it by themselves, um, and other ones watch it with another person who is initially a stranger. And one of the things we're really interested in is how um, do we create shared effective experiences, and how can we measure them and model them um, um, in the laboratory using these naturalistic tasks? Um, so I'm showing you a scene from one of the episodes where um, this is the girlfriend and best friend of, of the, um, the quarterback who um, became a, a, had a spinal cord injury. And they're like very distraught and dealing with different ways. And then they're trying to comfort each other. And like, one thing leads to another. Um, and you can kind of see that um, all of the participants are, are showing different degrees in specifically very distinct types of facial expressions to these events. So some of them show like a little bit of like a disgust or concern or maybe um, but then some other ones um, uh, either think it's funny or actually enjoy what's happening and you see some smiling at when it happens. So there's this huge um, variation in range of how people are interpreting these events. Um, but what's interesting is that people who are watching together end up um, synchronizing more in time and they also show higher degrees of intensity, um, specifically in, in positive um, feelings like joy. Um, and beyond that, we, we can also, um, we've measured other things like uh, arousal levels through skin conductance, um, how they think of the characters. So we have them uh, fill out a bunch of questionnaires after each episode. And um, the more that people share um, similar impressions of the characters, that loads onto this um, common shared experience factor. And not just um, um, how people are expressing or when they're smiling in time, but also how they're smiling, meaning that the, the spatial configuration of their muscles seem, um, actually um, synchronizes for some um, dyads as well. And all of these load onto a common component of this, the shared experience and predict um, the degree to which um, these individuals and the dyads um, uh, report feeling connected with each other. So the more they start aligning, um, the more connected they feel. And this actually grows over time as they spend more time. So while this is an interaction, it's not, it's sort of a passive viewing one. And there's some type of dynamic response where people are fee um, providing feedback to each other to adapt to each other, which is interesting, but it's not really like a direct interaction. Um, so to study that, um, in collaboration with Tolly Wheatley um, and, and our shared student, Emma Templeton, um, we've been trying to study naturalistic conversations. And so how this works is we recruited a bunch of, they're mostly um, Dartmouth undergraduates at the moment, <clears throat> um, to participate in the study. And they were recru recruited in groups. So each group had 11 different participants. And then they did a round robin where they did a 10 minute conversation with every other participant. And we recruited six groups, which um, amounts to about 322 conversations. And a subset of these participants we brought back um, to also uh, have a conversation with a close friend. Um, so we could try to compare like stranger versus friend um, uh, conversation. 
Okay, so most of this um, work, it's very, very exploratory, as you might imagine. And um, there's actually surprising little work. Um, there's so much work on, in linguistics and natural language processing, but most of it's focused on written language and maybe some spoken, but not so much in the context of conversations. So a lot of what we've been trying to do is, is, is just to um, uh, do some basic descriptives of what's going on. So we can see who's talking and when and for how long, and how does that relate to conversation enjoyment or social connection? Um, and it turns out that um, dyads, stranger dyads that uh, speak um, more frequently and take more turns and also have shorter gaps in between each turn um, are all associated with um, more enjoyable conversations and feeling more connected with that um, partner. So that's just something we naturally observe in, in the data. Um, but to really like see if that's it's actually something real, uh, we basically uh, did another study where we took some um, clips of these conversations and then systematically manipulated by like 100 or 200 milliseconds um, the amount of gap in between each turn. So it's the same conversation, but we're, we're, um, we're causally manipulating the duration of the gap. And then we have um, third party participants rate how connected do you think these two people are? And we find that shorter gaps, people perceive them to be uh, more connected, even though the conversation content is identical. We can also validate this in other types of contexts, such as the close friends. And we have a preliminary finding, um, which doesn't, isn't as robust as it looks actually at the moment, uh, where friends might be having overall shorter gap lengths um, compared to stranger conversations. So we have a whole bunch of work where we're trying to just do these basic descriptions of these conversations. And we have another line of work where we're trying to come up with new ways to quantify um, some of the meaning or the, the, the interactions that are happening between people interpersonally in these conversations. And so I just wanna give you a flavor of some of the things we're working on um, where we're trying to uh, quantify uh, conversation trajectories using <clears throat> um, uh, me measures of semantic similarity. <clears throat> So how this works is for every turn, we take the transcripts of the conversation and um, apply uh, um, a natural language processing model. This one is um, the universal sentence encoder from um, Google. And this basically um, provides an embedding into some space that the, the dimensions don't really matter, um, but that we can now quantify each um, turn for a sentences or paragraphs that people are, are speaking and say how similar they are. And basically it come, it, when we try to validate it, it does a nice job of, um, uh, how similar are uh, like from where you're from or what year you are or <clears throat> different like classes, all of those types of things get grouped together by using this metric. And what's nice is we can use um, <clears throat> uh, similarity and distance in this embedding space <clears throat> to start quantifying the dynamics of the conversation over time. So we're projecting this down to two dimensions um, just for plotting purposes and where the space here really is the topic space or the types of content that people um, are talking about in the conversation. And um, the colors represent where they are in time and the size of the circles here represent how long the turn is. And we have other ones where we can look at who the speaker is or we have other data on um, things that they're doing, like how, how connected they feel to the other people or um, how much they're moving or things like that. And we can also incorporate that over time with this. <clears throat> and this is still like actively being investigated. And we have lots of different um, sort of preliminary findings, but um, like in short, uh, so far what it looks like is compared to strangers, friends seem to travel faster and further in the conversation. So what that means is there's shorter gaps, um, there's faster speech rates, um, they have more turns overall. And also um, the distance, meaning how far they're actually traveling in, in each turn compared to strangers is further um, and, and when you're talking with a close friend. Um, so with that, I just wanna um, thank um, all the people who were involved in, in, in leading this work and also our funding agencies for supporting us.